Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for this Spring into Crafting mini-series. My name is Leah Zayner, and I am your moderator for today's event. Now, Craftsy, the National Quilter Circle, National Sewing Circle, and the Knitting Circle have all teamed up for a full week of live demonstrations and a bundle of free springtime patterns and recipes. You can download your free patterns and recipes by clicking the link in the description. And every day this week, a new instructor is going to stream live as we sew, quilt, knit, and bake together, and they will be providing step-by-step -step demonstrations of all of these fun springtime projects. If you have any questions at all during the event, that is what I am here for. I will keep my eyes on the comment box for you. That is the blue chat box below or in the chat on Facebook and YouTube. I'll keep an eye on those questions as they come in. And as usual, I like to feed any questions that are specific to the project in so that our instructor can answer them as close to the step that we are on as possible. And I save some general questions for the end. We usually have time for at least a few. So don't be afraid to pop in any question that comes into your head as the project goes on today. Now I'm ready to bring in our instructor. Today we have with us Ashley Huff. She's joining us. She's our quilting expert and managing editor of both the National Quilter Circle and the National Sewing Circle. Hello Ashley and welcome. Thank you for being here. I would love for you to start off by telling us just a little bit about yourself and then introducing the project you have for us today. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, like you said, I'm the managing editor of National Quilter Circle and National Sewing Circle. I have been sewing and quilting for over 20 years now. My mom taught me to sew when I was very, very little. I picked up quilting after that and then I uh, really haven't turned back since. So today I'm going to be showing you how to make the tulip block pillow. So it's starting to look like springtime in some places, maybe where you live more than where I live. So I have to bring the springtime colors inside. And um, so I'm doing that with this tulip block pillow. So I'm going to walk you through all of the uh, basic units that are used to make up the actual tulip shape and then we'll put it together into a block to make the pillow front. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the quilting that you can do on the pillow front. You can actually omit the quilting entirely if you just want to only have a pieced front. And then I'll show you how to do an envelope style back, which is my favorite way to do the back of a pillow. It is by far the easiest way and I think once you do it, you're never going to want to do it any other way. Perfect. All right. Just another reminder again, if you're just joining us, get those questions into the chat box. I'll send them to Ashley as she's taking us step by step through the project. But without further ado, we're going to dig right in. So let's get started with step number one, Ashley. Yes, absolutely. All right. So with the this project, you had a pattern that you can download. You're definitely going to want to download that pattern so you can see the complete cut list of everything you're going to need, um, because that is going to be a lot easier than listening to me tell you all of the different sizes of squares and rectangles that you're going to want to cut. So you're going to want to have all of those cut and ready to go. If you've already cut and have them ready, you can obviously sew along with me or you can always watch see how we make the units and then put this together afterwards. But then we're going to move into the assembly. So this is what the first page of the assembly looks like. And if you are uh, someone who's done some quilting in the past, you're going to recognize the first few things are going to make pretty easily. And the first is a half square triangle unit. So if you've never made one before, it is very, very simple. It is a square that is made up of two triangles. So half square triangle. So we're going to take our tulip uh, color. So I made a pink one before. I'm going to make an orange one now. And we need our background square. So these are three inch pieces. You should have two of each of them. And you need to draw a diagonal line from corner to corner on one of them. I generally will be doing all of my drawing and all of my marking on my background because my background is really, really light gray. So it's a lot easier to see my marking on. But if you are doing your pillow and maybe reverse colors and you have a really dark uh, blue for the sky or something and that's your background but your tulip is a really pale yellow maybe do your marking on your lighter color just to make it a little bit easier to see so I'm going to take and just use a standard pen or pencil with half square triangles the line that you are marking is going to be a cut line so it doesn't actually matter if it's a removable line or something you're going to be able to see or not so it doesn't matter what you use but go ahead and just take a ruler and draw the line diagonal line from corner to corner I'm going to draw mine pretty dark just so that I can hold it up and show you uh, that that's the line that I'm drawing. You don't have to draw it that dark. Really just make it to where you can see your line. You're going to go ahead and draw that on both of your three inch squares on the wrong side. Make sure you're doing it on the wrong side. I love to use solid fabrics whenever possible because the right and the wrong side look the same. So I have my line drawn on my wrong side. Now with right sides together, I'm going to put my background square that I just marked with my tulip color square. And I'm gonna go ahead and pin. 
Now, pinning is something that is either you like to do it or you don't like to do it. I'm going to reference Emily's video from yesterday. If you guys tuned in, I know she's not a pinner. I know some people aren't. I am an over pinner, if that's even a thing. Um, I like to pin a lot. I like to make sure things don't move. But so I'm gonna go ahead and just put a pin on each side of the line. But if you're comfortable with just holding it, you can go ahead and do that as well. And then once you have it pinned, it is time to stitch it. So with the half square triangle using the construction method that I'm showing right now, we have our pieces pinned right sides together and I'm going to stitch one quarter inch on both sides of this drawn line. So to do that, I am using a quarter inch foot. So this is what my quarter inch foot looks like on my machine. Yours might look a little bit different with quilting, you don't always have to have a quarter inch foot. A lot of people are comfortable just using a regular presser foot and adjusting that needle position and then going off of the edge of the foot. Whatever is easiest for you um, to be able to see the line that you're stitching on and make sure, or stitching next to, and make sure you're one quarter inch away. So I'm gonna go ahead and stitch here. You're not worried about doing any kind of back stitching. You're just going to stitch right along that line and I'm gonna stop with my needle down. I've stitched on one, and now I'm gonna do a technique called chain piecing, which is where I stitch right off of one, right onto the other. So I'm gonna bring my second one up. I'm gonna stitch right off of the first one, right onto the second one, and just keep going. So chain piecing, if you've never done it before, it will save you so much time and actually a little tiny bit of thread in between each piece as well. So it's really, really handy. You can do this with however many pieces you have or you want to use. Um, when you get done with like this one, we only have two. Uh, all you're gonna do is raise up your needle, go ahead and lift your presser foot, pull it out so you have just a little bit of thread and then just spin it around. And now you're gonna go ahead and stitch the other side. Again, we'll stitch right off of one and right onto the other. So super easy, one of my favorite time-saving techniques for sure. Go ahead and clip your threads. And then I went ahead and used black thread in the bobbin so you could really, really see my stitching lines. So again, this is the, I drew my line down the center and I sewed one quarter inch on each side and you can see that with my black bobbin. So once it is stitched, now you're going to remove your pins clip apart your squares, and then you're going to cut on that drawn line. So you can use a ruler if you want and be very, very accurate with your cutting, or I'm just gonna bring in my uh, rotary cutter and cut right along that line. And now I have my half square triangle, so right like that. So I'm gonna cut this apart because you do need four of these. Right like so. Then once they are cut apart, now we need to press them because you want to actually press them and make them into the square that they need to become. So I have a couple little tips when pressing half square triangles. Uh, the first one is that you always wanna make sure you're setting the seam. So this is something that I think is important really in any kind of piecing, whether it's half square triangles, whether you're putting together any unit, and that is to set the seam before you open up those two layers of fabric and press them. So to do that, you just put it down on your pressing mat, put your iron on it, set the seam, take it off, ta-da, <laughs> the seam has been set. So that's all you have to do there. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that with all of my pieces. Uh, kind of do multiple here at a time, just get them all under the iron, set them all down. And now you want to open it up and you're going to press to one side. Now I, and I believe even in the instructions, tell you to press towards your tulip color. Again, my, I'm doing that because my tulip color is the darker of the two colors. But if your color scheme is something a little bit different, um, I always recommend pressing towards the dark color. So if you're pressing whatever color of fabric you wanna to press towards, you want that to be on the top. And then you fold it over. I like to use my fingers first, give it a little finger press, bring in my iron and press it down. So very important when you are um, pressing anything that you press, not iron, you're not going back and forth, you're just going straight up and down with pressing. Uh, when I do this, it might look like I'm moving my iron a little bit on it, um, but that is I'm sort of hovering my iron just slightly, making sure that I'm using the edge of my iron to push over that fabric a little bit before I press it down. That way I don't get, um, what would be called like a false seam or something. And that would be where if you didn't have it completely pressed open and you had like this little divot or sort of lip in there, that's kind of a false seam. So you wanna make sure that it is pressed open as far as possible. So that's why it helps to do it with your finger first. And then again, use the edge of that iron 
sort of wiggle it a little bit to get it open. Press it, and we'll do our last one here. And then we have our four half square triangles. Okay, once those are pressed, now we need to square them up. So generally, uh, when you are reading instructions for half square triangles, there are two different ways that they will be uh, sort of presented to you. One is with a measurement that is a seven eighths measurement, which is something that people either love seeing or hate seeing. Um, and if you see a half square triangle that tells you to cut something at say two and seven eighths, that means that when you have made it and you press it open, it's going to be perfect exact to whatever size it needs to be. I like to round mine up. That's why I had you cut three inch squares instead. That gives you just that little bit of wiggle room. So, you know, maybe you were off just a little bit when you're stitching that quarter inch on either side of the line. It's going to give you just a little bit of extra and make your half square triangle oversized. That way you can then trim it down or square it up. So we need these to be two and a half inches. And if I take and put this behind my ruler up here so you can see it better like this, um, you can see that it is just a smidge over two and a half inches, which means we just need to square it up or trim it down. So I'm going to take my square ruler all square rulers, it doesn't really matter what uh, brand you use. I like the Omni Grip ruler because it grips on the fabric and doesn't slide, but they will all generally have this diagonal line. This one has one on both sides. And I'm gonna put that diagonal line on my seam between my two colors. And I am going to then make sure that all sides are slightly over that two and a half inches. Two and a half inches is what we're trying to square down to. So if I were to accidentally say, pull it too far back and I have it underneath um, or inside that two and a half inches, I'm gonna make my piece too small and I'm gonna have to cut some more. So I'm gonna start by making sure all four sides are slightly over two and a half inches. My diagonal line is right there on that seam and I'm going to trim both these sides. You should be cutting off the tiniest amount. If I can pick this up, that's all we're cutting off. Like it's tiny, tiny amount. And you might think it's not important to do this step or that it's, uh, you know, it's fine if there's a little extra, but really you want to make sure that you are as uh, accurate on your measurements and your cutting as possible. So now I, I trim this side. So I rotated it around. I'm going to bring my square ruler back in here. Again, I have my diagonal line on my seam. Now those two edges I just trimmed that are perfectly straight, perfectly perpendicular to each other are now going to be lined up on my two and a half inch line on my ruler. And now I can go ahead and trim the other two sides and I have a perfect half square triangle. Trimming it, squaring it up, it makes it the right measurement and also gets rid of all those little dog ears, which just makes it easier when we're going to assemble them later. So I'm gonna go ahead and trim up my other three, but of course, if anyone has any questions about half square triangles or anything up to this point, I would love to hear it. We don't have any questions yet about half square triangles, but if you have any, this is the time to get them in. I'm gonna give a quick reminder, and then we do have one more general question I'd like to ask for everybody viewing. So first of all, if you are just joining us or you didn't catch the very beginning, uh, you do not have to be sewing along with us. If you prefer to go ahead and download this free pattern, you can get that download now and you can hang on to it and do all of this work later. This is also rewatchable for you. So if Ashley is covering something that isn't quite clicking right now, you can always come back to it and watch her tutorial over and over until it makes sense for you and you can practice as you go. So don't worry if you're not sewing along with us today. This is always rewatchable for you. Um, I'm going to go right back to one of the questions that came in very early. Um, and this is from Sarah. And this is about what size the pillow is going to be. So we're making this pillow. What size are we making, Ashley? Yes, yeah, so this quilt block finishes at 16 and a half inches. Um, so once you actually sew it into the pillow, it's going to be a 16 inch finished pillow, which is perfect for a 16 inch pillow form. If you wanna buy one already made, um, that way you don't have to you know, stuff or make your own pillow. So I like to make pillows that finish at either you know, 10, 12, 14, 16, one of those pre-made pillow form purchasing options. Uh, it's just a little bit easier to do. Perfect. Um, and then Marilyn is just thinking this is a wonderful idea. So we're looking forward to seeing uh, the rest of the steps. 
Perfect. All right, so we had our half square triangles. This was step number one. That's what we just did. Now we're going to move on to something that, again, if you have done any kind of quilting, is going to be a very recognizable unit, something that you have probably made several of, and that is a flying geese unit. So for this one, you have a rectangle that is going to be your tulip color, and you have two squares that are your background color. Again, we're going to do some marking. And that is on our background squares, and we're going to draw that diagonal line from corner to corner. This one, since I did my first one really, really dark so I could show you, you know, where the line is supposed to be going, it didn't matter because that was going to be a cut line. I was cutting on it. I wasn't going to see it. This one is not a cut line. This is actually a line that you're going to be sewing on. So I'm only going to draw it dark enough for me to be able to see it because whenever you're marking a sewing line, that means you're sewing on it and it's going to forever be there if you're not using some kind of removable option. So I'm just using a standard mechanical pencil. So I mean, if after I use my pillow for a while, then I wanna throw my pillow cover into the wash, it is just going to disappear. But I mean, if I were going to come in here and just use an office pen or something a lot thicker that wasn't a removable option, um, you have the tendency of actually seeing a really thick marking line on a really light colored fabric. So just kind of think that, think through your, your marking utensil um, when you are making those lines. I'm going to take and lay my uh, rectangle. This is right side up and I'm going to put my square right side down. So again, right sides together on one side of my rectangle. It doesn't really matter which side I start with. I'm just right-handed. So I always start on this side and I want my line to be going from the lower corner to the upper center. So this is my diagonal line that I drew. And then of course I'm gonna put a couple pins in because I don't want it to move. So I like to pin just one on either side of the line. Uh, that way I know for one, it's not gonna move, but two, I don't like to have to remove my pins while I'm stitching. Um, so I wanna make sure that they're out of the way of the presser foot. So once I have my pins in place, now I'm gonna take this over to the machine and I am stitching directly on that line. And in terms of stitching, it's always easiest to start at the center of the rectangle. So since it's already on my machine, this is our rectangle. It's a lot easier to start stitching at the center of the rectangle than it is to try and start stitching at a sharp point like this. If you try and start stitching down here, odds are you're gonna push that fabric down into the needle plate of your machine and it's gonna get stuck. So it's a lot easier to start stitching along a straight edge than it is to start stitching at a point. But I'm gonna stitch all the way on that line, go ahead and trim my threads and remove my pins. This is what we just did right here. Again, you can see my bobbin thread is black, so there's our stitching line. And now we need to press this to make it into our flying geese. And this is one thing that I do a little bit differently than you might have seen other people construct flying geese, and that is I like to press before I trim anything away. Uh, this just helps to make sure that my flying geese is going to stay the rectangular size and shape that I want it to be and it's not going to get skewed a little bit. I mean it is a flying geese but we don't really want it to be moving its wings at all. We need it to be very stationary and a perfect rectangle. So what I'm going to do is again always set your seam. doesn't no matter what you're making. Go ahead and set that seam right like so. And now I'm going to take and I'm going to fold up my square that I just stitched and I'm going to finger press it first before I bring in my iron. But the reason I like to press first before I trim it away is because this right here is what I'm going to trim away. This, this back little triangle of my tulip and this back little triangle of my background fabric. And if I were to trim this away before I pressed, I have nothing now to line this up against to make sure that I am maintaining my rectangular shape. But if I leave this here, then when I fold it up, I can make sure that I am perfectly aligned along the top and along this edge. Then once I know I am, then I can again come in here, give it a nice hard press. I like to use steam most of the time. Uh, press it so you know that you are good to go. Once it is pressed like this, now I can lay it down, lift up the triangle that I wanna keep and go ahead and trim off this excess here. So just keeping that for that extra little step I mean, it doesn't really uh, make it any longer or harder. You're not really saving time or adding time. You have to trim it away eventually, but just having it there so you can line it up. Now we know that we are maintaining our rectangle. Once we have one side stitched on, now I'm gonna bring my other square. 
Again, right sides together, it is gonna go on the opposite side of my rectangle. My diagonal line that I drew needs to go from the lower corner up to the center. Go ahead and pin it. And then we'll stitch on this line as well. All right, same thing as with the other side, it's always easiest to start stitching right up here at the center of the rectangle, even though there's now essentially four layers of fabric that you're stitching through, it's still easier to start there than trying to start stitching right at that point. So I'm going to stitch on this line. Trim my threads, remove my pins. Right, like so, and then same thing. Set my seam, go ahead and fold it up and press before I trim anything away, and then trim away that excess. Now, Ashley, Kaylee has a question about what you just got rid of when you trimmed. Yeah. Do you ever keep the little ends to make another square? So I keep them, but not, not for the reason that you are probably thinking. I know that uh, a lot of people do make things from the extra pieces. So what I trimmed away, which I'm going to trim away some more in a minute too, are just these little ones here. So I could sew them together and make a pretty tiny square. I always have good intentions of doing that and I do tend to save these um, and then I put them all in a little bin and then they become amazing little toys for my one and four year old. So that's what they turn into. So they do have a purpose, just they don't actually turn into any other actual quilt project. But if I was making a much, much larger um, uh, flying geese, I probably would save them, but little pieces like this, I'll, they'll just go into that little play pile. <laughs> okay, so we did our uh, flying geese. That was the other main piece or main component of the tulip portion of this block. And now we need to make some of the little leaves. So I'm going to bring up our, our tulip here again, so you can see this one here. So we've kind of made everything that makes up this center portion. I know it was really just very basic, simple units, but this, if you recognize right here at the top, this is the flying geese that we just made. Right here, 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 and here are the four half square triangles that we made at the beginning. And then this is just a plain solid rectangle in the middle. So we essentially have our tulip body uh, already, the components of it already made and done very, very simply. So now we need to focus on our leaf sections because uh, I think that every tulip needs a really pretty stem and of course some leaves. So again, this is going to be made from something that is sort of um, the start of a very recognizable unit. So it's similar to making a square and a square unit, but we're gonna kind of stop halfway. So we're only adding squares to two sides of our um, leaf square. So again, these, if you reference your cutting instructions, you're going to see that you're going to need two different sizes of your leaf. So we have a big leaf for the bottom, a smaller leaf for the top. And for each of those different sizes, you'll have four of your background squares. And this is going to be what is going to get added to those corners. So very similar in terms of what we just did with half square triangles and we just did with flying geese is we need to do some marking again. Again, those diagonal lines on the wrong side of the fabric. And you're gonna wanna do that on all of your uh, background fabric squares. So there should be eight of them. And I know if you are someone who maybe printed this pattern ahead of time, you were reading through those cutting instructions and you saw that you were cutting an inch and a quarter squares. That's probably the smallest square you've ever cut for a quilt. Um, don't be intimidated by the small size of them. I know they sound very small and they obviously look super small to work with, but it's very, very simple. It's, you're treating them just like you would for the squares for a flying geese. Um, so don't be intimidated by small little pieces. They make them look super cute. While you're going ahead and adding those lines, we actually have a couple comments coming in about your iron. So Layla yes. loves the iron and Maureen is curious about what kind it is. So if you'd like yes. to talk about that, that'd be great. Absolutely. So this is my absolute favorite iron ever. <laughs> I, would, I would love for them to send me irons and I will talk about them all the time, but I'll talk about them anyway. But this is the Oliso iron. So it's the Oliso Pro. So they're one of their main, um, I'm pretty sure it's a, probably a trademark thing. I think they're the only ones that have it, is uh, what the auto lift function. So there's a little button on the back that you can turn it on and off so you can make it just like a regular iron if you're someone who wants to you know, put your iron up like this. But it, with this activated like that, as soon as I touch it, it goes down and will iron. And as soon as I let go, it will come off. So I never have to lift it up or do anything. Um, and I never have to worry about it, you know, me accidentally leaving it down and it's scorching something, it will automatically just 
pop right back up. I've been admiring it myself too. So I'm <laughs> glad people were asking about it. It's fascinating. <laughs> good, good. It's, it's definitely one of my favorite sewing room tools. All right, so I have marked all of my background squares. The larger of the background squares go on the larger of the leaves, smaller background squares, smaller leaves. So all I'm gonna do is do one here first. I have it um, sort of just in a diamond shape towards me because I'm going to be putting a background square on two opposite corners. It doesn't matter which corner it is, it just needs to be opposite one another. So right sides together, place in two opposite corners and your, your drawn lines should go from a straight edge of the square to a straight edge of the square. Your lines should not connect through the center. So if your line is going through the center of the square, you have it going the wrong direction. So make sure that your lines are parallel to one another going from straight edge of the square to straight edge of the square. And of course I'm going to pin them. And then that's how I'm going to line them up on all of my squares. So all of the leaf squares should get two background uh, squares on them, smaller background squares. Again, I'm gonna pin just right on the corners and make sure they're out away enough that I don't actually have to remove them while I'm stitching by them. They are just going to make sure that nothing shifts. Uh, another question has come in while you're doing your pinning. Um, yeah. Actually, I said this uh, earlier, Kaylee asked a question. I'm realizing the username is Kaylee and River. So I suppose it could be either. If you want to say a shout out, which one of you is watching, I'll make sure to get it right the next time. But Kaylee or River is curious if you like using friction pens. I do. I actually just ordered some of those uh, recently. I got them through Madam So and I actually got them even through Amazon. And so friction pins, if you're not familiar with them, are heat removable pins. So they are ones, they look almost just like a regular ballpoint pen. Um, but as soon as you hit it with an iron, the ink disappears. And I think it is very, very handy. Um, I have used them quite a bit to mark. I don't always do a lot of very detailed quilting on my own, a lot of free motion quilting, anything like that. So without marking. So I do like to do use those for markings and things like that. The one thing I have read that I haven't tried out yet, um, but I did read that if you have removed a line with your friction pin and you expose that fabric to really, really, really cold temperatures, I'm talking like maybe on a jacket and then walk outside in the winter, that those lines can reappear. I don't know if that's true or not. So if somebody that lives in a cold climate wants to test that out for us, like I live in West Texas, it's not happening here, but if somebody wants to test it out, I would love to know if that really does happen. Because if so, that would be my only thing to caution against is if that line, like for this, it would be perfect. Because even if this line reappears, not a huge deal. But um, if it was on something where you might see it, I would caution against that. But I would be interested to know if anyone knows about that. All right, well, I'll keep my eye out and see if anybody drops that info into the chat box. Perfect. All right, so now that I have all four of my leaf squares pinned with their smaller background fabric squares, I'm gonna go ahead and stitch. These are ones where we're stitching on that drawn line, and I'm actually going to chain piece these as well, which is something that I think a lot of times people think you can only chain piece when you're going right off of the edge versus like the center of a piece, but you can really chain piece with anything. So with this, I'm gonna go ahead and start on one. I'm going to stitch all the way along that line. Go ahead and stop with my needle down, bring my next piece in, and then with this one, it's a little bit, I guess, harder to get it lined up because you have to overlap the piece you're adding over the one you just stitched, but you can still just bring it right up uh, to the edge. So you can stitch right off of one, right onto the other. It doesn't work as good to be able to do two different sizes at the same time, so I'm just gonna do these two pieces. Same thing though, I'm going to lift my presser foot, raise my needle, just pull out some thread so I have enough so I can spin it around and then go ahead and stitch this other side. So again, right down one, stitch right off of it and then go ahead and slide this next one up, realigning it uh, so you can stitch right onto the next one. So again, if, it's, if you've never tried out chain piecing before, I think you're really gonna love it once you do it. Um, and if, so imagine if you had a really long line of these that you were piecing, it's just gonna keep everything nice and straight and together. You're not going to say, you know, stitch one, set it to the side, maybe lose it if you have a bunch of them. Uh, so it kind of helps keep everything together as well. So I'm gonna do the same thing with my smaller pieces. Again, I'll stitch right off of one, go ahead and bring up my other one. 
and stitch this guy too. Spin around. And right onto my last piece. So like with this one here, if you're having a hard time like pushing that second one up, just go ahead and bring it from the bottom back to the top. Obviously it was on the top when you added it on the first side, but then when we flipped it around, it would have been on the bottom. But with smaller pieces, sometimes that can just make it a little bit easier if you bring whichever piece you're stitching next up to the top. Once you have all of them stitched together, go ahead and clip all your threads, remove your pins, um, and then I'm going to go ahead and clip these apart. And then of course, I'm going to uh, set my seams and then use the same similar technique that I did when I was making my flying geese where I did not trim anything away first. I'm gonna use that same technique here. Again, especially with these smaller squares, like on the smaller leaf, leaving that background there so you have something to line up against when you fold it up so you know that it's not gonna be off at all. It just makes it that much easier. So again, I'm gonna take all these, set the seam and on pressing them up. There's one, there's the other one. There like so. And once you set the seam too, it just sort of warms up the fibers of the fabric, warms up the thread a little bit, um, and makes it a lot easier to then finger press with a shape like this where you're coming from both sides. That way you can have it sort of exactly where you want it. Let me move these out of the way. Exactly where you want them, and then be able to hold both sides down, and then come in here with your iron. That way you're not having to try and press one side first, rotate it around, then press the other side. You can go ahead and press them both at the same time. So this is what it should look like. Again, you'll have that same little test where you can, uh, this is what we're gonna trim away. So you can fold that up, make sure that it lines up perfectly. You still have your square shape. And then go ahead and do that with all four of our leaves. So finger press first, hold it open, and then come in here with your iron. And if you do not wanna get that close to your fingers with the iron, I know I'm getting like, it might look like I'm a lot closer than I really am. You can absolutely press one side first and then press the other. Don't feel like you have to press them both at the same time. Um, it's just with how wide they are, the iron obviously covers both sides pretty easily. Uh, so it's, I think, easier to do. But by, by all means, you don't have to. Last one, and then I will trim away our little excess triangles. And definitely on a triangle like this, these little ones would definitely go into my son's play fabric pile. I would not be trying to stitch those together into any kind of, of quilt. But I'm even going to just use my little uh, snips here on these guys because that's all that I'm cutting away is this tiny little piece. So no need to bring the rotary cutter in for these. And just trim those all away. And these are the main components of the tulip portion itself. So if you are referencing the cutting instructions, you're going to see that we did cut out uh, quite a bit of other squares and rectangles, but all of that is background fabric. That's all going to go around the tulip and really help make sure that the tulip is the star of this block and of this pillow. So I've just got a couple more to trim here. Last one. And we have all of our components made. So if you are someone who um, maybe is new to quilting or is coming from a sewing background, never done a whole lot of quilting, this is a, a really easy quilt block to put together. Again, it finishes at 16 inches, which is perfect for this pillow. But 16 inches is also a really uh, fun block size to finish. You could actually make a couple of different colors of tulips, kind of like what I'm doing here. Put them together into a quilt and very quickly and easily have a throw size quilt with just a few tulips. So it's a really good uh, sort of intro to quilting quilt block if you've never made one before. But so back to our instruction pages, we've kind of made it through our half square triangles, we made it through our flying geese, we've made it through our little stems, and now we're going to move on to the next page here where we're actually starting to lay out uh, the shape of the tulip. So when I am working on any project, whether it is um, a, 
a block like this where there isn't a whole lot of pieces or as one that there's a bunch of pieces and there's lots of components that are going in all different directions. I like to, uh, you know, clear a workspace in front of me and make what I'm going to call sort of a, a puzzle area. I always refer to what I'm putting together in my quilt block as a puzzle. That way I can, I can uh, assemble it in a way, like I can lay it out and make sure it looks like what it's supposed supposed to look like. Then I'm going to take pieces to the machine and sew them, then put them right back down on my, my mat so I can always make sure that it's going to look the way it's supposed to. So I'm going to start by um, referencing my uh, instructions here as to how I need to be laying them out, but we need to have our half square triangles. You want to make sure you have them going in the correct direction so you actually get a tulip shape. And then we have a flying geese here in the middle, right, like so. You have a plain square here. This was the um, other rectangle that we cut, right, like so. And now we have our other flying geese, or sorry, half square triangles that are gonna go on here like this. We're gonna sew those together into rows, like so. And then we have the one really, really large rectangle that we cut and that is going to go in the middle. And then once this all comes together, it's going to look like our tulip shape. So this is how I like to lay out what I'm going to call my puzzle to make sure that I know everything looks the way I want it to before I start sewing, especially when you have things like half square triangles that it would be very easy to accidentally get one rotated the wrong direction. So I'm going to start here on the bottom because it's closest to me and it's actually the easiest one. But all we need to do is fold our pieces right sides together so we can sew it. So I'm gonna take this one, fold it right up and over, align it right sides together. I'm gonna to go ahead and pin it like so, just a couple pins. That way I can go ahead and pin the other side on as well and stitch them both at the same time while I'm up at my machine. So fold this one up and over, spin it around so I can pin it. Now I have everything aligned, pinned, and ready to go. Right, like so. And now I'm going to stitch. Now we don't have any more drawn lines or anything. We are down to just classic basic piecing that is using our quarter inch seam allowance, not worrying about doing any back stitching at the beginning or end. Let's go ahead and flip this around, stitch our other side as well. Make sure that that seam allowance on that half square triangle is going the direction that you press it in as you stitch over it. When you're stitching down one side, it's going to be laying in the direction that your presser foot is going, so it's going to easily glide right over it. The other side is going sort of against the grain, so you're just going to want to make sure that it stays the way you want it to stay. So now I will do a quick check, lay it back down on my little puzzle piece, make sure it still looks like a tulip, and if it does, you're doing good. Go ahead and set those seams first. Always, always set your seams. And now I'm just going to press these up to one side. In a quilt pattern, this one, any quilt pattern, sometimes there will be pressing instructions, sometimes there won't be pressing instructions. I will generally include pressing instructions in a pattern if the direction that you press the seams actually matters. And by that I mean if you are making a block that has lots of pieces that come together and you have to have one going one way because it lines up with one going another way and you want those to nest, then I'll make sure and say which way to press. But in terms of this one here, this piece is going to go onto this one, which has no seam allowances. So it doesn't matter which direction you press these seam allowances, it would be just fine. So in general, it is always easiest to press towards the side that has the least amount of seam allowances. So in this case, I have a half square triangle, which has one seam allowance, and I have a rectangle that has none, so I'm gonna to press towards the rectangle. So that's the direction I press those seams, um, sort of personal preference on that one. But now that I have that one done, I'm gonna come up here to this top one because it is just a little bit more complicated in terms of how I want my seams to nest. So we have a flying geese here, and we have a half square triangle. I wanna put them right sides together, like so, and I want to make sure that uh, uh, in addition to having just this raw edge aligned here, that I have these seams right here nested. So I have a seam allowance going to the left on the bottom from my flying geese, and I have one going to the right on the top from the half square triangle, and I want to make sure that those nest together. So I'm going to kind of use my fingers and make sure 
you should feel them like locked together. Once you are putting pressure on them and trying to use your fingers to slide them, you shouldn't be able to slide them past one another. They should lock together. So make sure that happens and your edge is a line that you want to stitch along and then go ahead and pin and do the same thing with the other side as well. It's always, always helpful when a seam locks or nests. It just makes it even easier to make sure that things are aligned and are going to lay the way you want them to. Now, while you're pinning here, we do have a question coming in from D. Is it possible to use small clips instead of pins or are there even specific spots where it's easy to make that switch and maybe not so simple? Yeah, I mean, you can definitely use um, those little binder clips or little wonder clips if you want to use those as well. Um, the only thing with them is they are, I think the smallest clip that I've ever seen is probably still three eighths of an inch uh, in diameter or across, I guess would be the, the, the measurement. And so if you imagine trying to put even one or two, like one clip up here to hold your nested seams, you wouldn't even really have room for a second clip down here. So I tend to use clips on either much bigger projects or holding binding in place, much longer projects. I think pins are easier on smaller pieces. And of course, if you're someone who just doesn't want to use pins and have has been doing, you know, sewing and quilting for a while and are comfortable just holding them, um, you don't have to pin. But yeah, anywhere I think on a, a larger piece or longer piece, I think those, those clips would be uh, much easier to use. So once this has been sewn, same thing, I'm going to set my seams and I'm going to press. With this one, I don't really have the luxury of having a solid rectangle in the middle. This one, it's sort of um, one seam allowance on one side, one seam allowance on the other. So it doesn't really um, matter which way you go with this seam either in terms of pressing. So really go with whichever way is easiest. And sometimes I find that's just easiest to press away uh, from the largest piece. And by that I mean I have my largest piece on the bottom and it's a lot easier to just sort of fold this up and press uh, with my seam allowance going this way than it would be to try and tuck that seam allowance under. So I'm always about trying to press whichever direction it's just easier to do that. Either because there's less seam allowances or sometimes even if you have multiple seam allowances on both sides, the fabric will really just tell you which way it wants to go. It will just be much easier to fold it to one side and that's, don't fight it. Just go, <laughs> go to that side. All right. So I've got my last little piece here. I'm gonna put that back into my puzzle. Bring that down. Um, and you can see that my tulip shape is coming together exactly how it should. So now I'm going to do the same thing where I just flip it up to align my pieces right sides together. This one is gonna go here. I'm gonna go ahead and pin it on. This one's gonna go right here. I'm gonna go ahead and pin this on. And that way I can stitch them both at the same time. So you know me, I'm gonna put in probably three to four pins along each side here that it stays put. Well, if you are keeping track about team pin and team no pin from yesterday and today, you did just win a convert. Uh, Dee says she's going to go back to using pins. So, <laughs> all right, it's perfect. All right, we're going to start. We're going to start a tally. You know, one for one, go back and forth. I think so. I have to say, I mean, like I said, I've been sewing and quilting for quite a long time, and there are times if I. Uh, where I won't always pin. So if I'm being honest, sometimes making half square triangles like we did at the very beginning, if I have a quilt that has, I mean, 50 of them or 100 of them, and I just look at this, this stack that I have to get through and think about how much time I would save if I didn't pin them, knowing that I you know, made them oversized and I'm going to trim them down, I might scrimp there a little bit, but not very often do I do that. <laughs> Oh, Rebecca's got a good question. Um, this is a pretty common one, I think. So probably a lot of other people have this question as well. Do you wash your fabric before you're making this pillow? I did not. And I know that the pre-wash or not pre-wash quilting fabric is sort of a hotly debated topic amongst quilters um, all the time. And I didn't because I know that this is very high quality quilt shop cotton fabric. Um, it's not crazy um, dark red or dark purple or something that I'm really, really worried about those colors bleeding at all. Um, if I was worried about that, I might pre-wash or 
just because I really want to, as soon as I buy the fabric, I really want to just get to the project and make it. If I'm um, worried about a fabric, if I look at it, I've never bought maybe that brand before or from that quilt shop or something, and it's a dark color, I will snip just the tiny little bit of it, a little square or something, put it in a bowl of warmed hot water or however I think I'd be washing whatever that finished project is. And I'm going to let it sit in there for a little bit, maybe even, you know, rub it between my fingers and see if the water changes colors at all. And if it does, even in the slightest amount, then I'll probably wash that fabric. But for something like this, I did not. Also, um, this is a pillow that my son's probably going to lay on, my dog might slobber on. It's going to get washed enough times that I didn't feel the need to pre-wash it too. <laughs> Okay. okay. Real quick, me. I wanted to say on this step, sorry. So that I just sewed one side here. I'm going to go ahead and sew this next side. But up here, I have my um, seam allowances from where my flying geese and my half square triangles came together. And I have what is called, I always call it the X marks the spot. And this is where two seam allowances come together. Again, I use that black thread in my bobbin. So hopefully you can see that really good. There's that little X right there. And that's exactly where you want to be stitching through. So that X should be exactly one quarter inch from the edge. And you want to make sure that you're stitching right through that. And that way you know that your pieces are going to be lined up. So just a little check um, while you are stitching to make sure that everything is going to look the way you want it to um, once you're done. All right, and while Ashley is stitching, a reminder for everybody watching, we are getting into the last 15 minutes of our time together for this project. So if for some reason you are sitting on a question and you haven't asked it yet, this is the time to drop it into the chat box. We'll get to as many as possible as Ashley's wrapping up the project, but this is probably the time that you want to get those into the chat box. So drop it now and I'll keep an eye on them and get Ashley as many as we can before we'll have to say goodbye in about 15 minutes. All right, back to you, Ashley. Perfect. All right. So I just set my seams on this and I am pressing again, always pressing in the path of least resistance. So that was towards our center um, because there is no seam allowances there. And this is now our tulip. So you can see that the, it really came together easy in terms of how we're putting our puzzle together and all of our pieces. It was really just straight basic piecing. So I don't want to make you watch me so like a bunch of little pieces together, but I do want to just uh, show you how the layout goes in terms of if you're following along either with me right now and you have your instructions, you've already printed off. If you haven't printed them off, even if you have done quilting before and you can look at the pillow and you can easily recognize those half square triangles and flying geese, it's still a little bit easy to accidentally get pieces in the wrong direction. So do have these and reference them in terms of how things need to be laid out in terms of all of those background squares and rectangles so that your leaves and everything go where they're supposed to go. So just to kind of give you an idea of how those are going to come together, because then I do want to talk about how to put together that envelope style back because you're never going to want to make a pillow another way. But the other, only other tricky part, I shouldn't even say tricky, um, part where I always want to say paying attention to orientation in terms of your pieces are the leaves. So they are the only other piece that really has a direction to them. Everything else is background rectangles that, you know, they can only really go one way. The stem can only really go one way. But with your leaves, you want to make sure that they are going, you know, out and away from the stem. So this is how they should be oriented. Just make sure you don't have them, you know, upside down wilty leaves, unless that's what you want. Uh, make sure that they are going in the right direction. You have your two large ones at the bottom and you have your two large or smaller ones at the top. And that is the last sort of complicated piece in terms of making sure it goes together the way that you want it to. Um, for completing the rest of it, definitely make sure um, you just look at the pieces step by step and it's going to show you uh, what size of rectangle goes with your leaves in terms of putting those together. Obviously our stem goes in the center, then everything else is just background squares around it. So it comes together pretty easily. Again, a really fun um, thing to make and obviously turn into the pillow or after I made this, then I really want to make more of them and I will probably make uh, like six or nine or something and I'm gonna turn it into a bigger quilt and lots of fun, pretty colors, but lots of fun ideas to do with it. So again, this is what it's going to look like when it is done. Um, want to talk before I talk about the envelope back about quilting, because this was a question that somebody asked me uh, personally earlier was whether or not you had to quilt it and you don't actually have to. Like I know in order for a quilt to become a quilt, you layer it with your batting and your backing fabric and you quilt through or you stitch through all of your layers because that's what's going to hold it together. This project, I wanted all of this stitching behind it, so I don't know if you can really see all the straight lines. I did some detailed stitching on the actual flower itself, 
I wanted that because I thought it really helped bring out the tulip shape. But if you want to just piece the block and then use it as the pillow front, you don't have to add any additional quilting. That's sort of an optional step. Um, and, you know, maybe if you're new to quilting and you want to play around with, you've never done straight line quilting or you've never done stitch in the ditch quilting or free motion or something. You have a new motif you want to try out. A simple little project like this is a great way to do that. But by all means, if you don't want to, you don't have to. But for the back, so in the cutting instructions, there were two large rectangles that you needed to cut. They are 16 and a half inches by 14 inches. So 16 and a half inches is how wide our block is going to finish. And the 14 inches is going to give us enough so that we can hem an edge of our pillow back and then overlap them to create this sort of pillow back. So I'm gonna do one at a time. And here is our big rectangle. So make sure you have it. I know it's almost a square, but it's not quite. So make sure you have the 16 and a half inches going this way, 14 going this way. Doesn't matter which one of your edges of your 14, um, but you want to do a double fold hem. So all this means is you are going to fold it twice. That's the double fold part. You're going to fold it to the wrong side twice and then press it and then stitch it. So on my pressing mat here, I even see them, my well used, I'm, I'm always going to use this well loved pressing mat, but mine has lines on it so I can see where an inch is. I'm going to double fold a half inch. So I'm just folding here, half inch first. I like to sort of finger press a little bit to get it started. Um, I am right-handed, so I'm going to bring my right iron over here, a little bit easier to do this way. But we are going to just come right along that edge, fold about a half inch. If you have done a lot of hems in your day or you have, I can easily eyeball a half inch, that's all I'm doing. Um, if you want to get very meticulous with it and measure that half inch, you can. It doesn't have to be perfect. But once you've folded it once and pressed it, go ahead and fold it a second time. Again, folding towards the wrong side and press right along here. Again, I'm using steam because I want it to press really nicely. Once you have that pressed, like, like so, now you just need to stitch it. So you want to stitch fairly close to this folded edge here. You have folded to the wrong side. I like to stitch so that I can see my fold. That way I can make sure that I'm staying right along it. However, if you are someone who doesn't match their needle thread and bobbin thread, which I will generally do with a project, I didn't for this project because I wanted you to be able to see my stitching line, but I will show you why when I'm done stitching here. If you did that, you might sometimes be disappointed with your, your um, thread that you can see. But so I had picked a white thread to go with my really light gray that's in my needle. But when I'm stitching this double fold hem down, it's my bobbin color that is on the right side. So I had that black thread in my bobbin so you could see my stitching line. So this is what you're going to see on the right side of your pillow. So if you are someone who does not match their needle and bobbin thread, make sure you either flip it over before you um, before you stitch it so that you are seeing the color that you want on that side um, or just remember to change out your bobbin before you um, do that stitching just so you aren't getting an unexpected surprise of dark black thread on your lovely tulip pillow and you didn't want it there. So I'm just prepping my other piece the exact same way. Again that double fold hem. I'm going to fold it a half inch to the wrong side, press it half inch to the wrong side, press it. And again, I know it looks like I'm ironing. I am pressing, I am moving it. And when I move it, I'm lifting up ever so slightly on the iron so that I'm not dragging it along that fabric and distorting it. I'm gonna go ahead and press that one. And then I would stitch it the exact same way. And then this becomes our pillow back. So in order to create the actual back of the pillow, all we need to do now is take and make sure that our folded hemmed edges are in the middle, right, like so. And I'm going to overlap those folded edges. It's going to be a little hard to see because I'm not sure I have 16 inches of space visible here, but I'm going to lay it out and then bring up the other pillow so I can show you. 
but our hemmed edges will overlap here. And then together, these become a 16 and a half inch square that, th that you then sew right sides together with your 16 and a half inch pillow front. So you can see we have our nice overlapped back. That way you can insert that pillow form, or in this case, I just inserted a bunch of fiber fill stuffing, but because our pillow back overlaps so much, you don't have to worry about that stuffing coming out at all. So very easily, I could take the stuffing out, I can wash my pillow, I could put in a different pillow form. If I'm not gonna use it for the season, suddenly it's fall or Christmas, I can take out, stuff it into another pillow, and I'm good to go. So this overlap, envelope style back to the pillow, um, I think is the best way to finish off a pillow. Oh my goodness, that looks fantastic. Well, good, good, thank you. We have got one question from two different viewers, and it is Ooh. about pressing. So uh, if you would like to talk a little bit about uh, this question, I think some people would appreciate hearing your thoughts. Would you, Ashley, ever press open? Ooh, yes, when necessary. <laughs> so I will say there are, on this project in particular, nowhere in it do I find it necessary to press open. And actually, I would think that it would be more complicated to do so, especially on a unit like a flying geese half square triangle. It would just be really hard to try and press that open. But say in a different project, you had a star block or something that had maybe three or four different seam allowances on one side coming together with a flying geese or something on the other side. So you had all of these seam allowances and to try and press all of that to one side, you would, you might even break a needle trying to quilt through that. Like it would just be so much fabric on one side that that is when I would say press open. That way you're going to evenly distribute all of those seam allowances as much as possible. But in terms of just most quilt patterns and most piecing, I always am going to one side or the other. So very rarely would I go open. All right, I'm gonna leave you with one final question. And then after you answer this question, Ashley, if you have any last thoughts, I'm gonna have you add those as well because all I have left is a few little reminders. So first, we have a little curiosity about what sewing machine you've been using. So if you can answer that for us and then go right into any last ideas that you might wanna share on this project, we would love to hear it before we say goodbye to you. Absolutely, so I'm using the Husqvarna Viking Epic 980Q. So it is uh, one that I've been using for a couple years now. It is my new all-time favorite machine. Probably don't wanna go back to using any other machine. Um, it's very, very computerized. So I mean, I could probably try and spin it around so you could see it, but it's got a touch screen that's probably bigger than my actual tablet. So if you're not someone who loves computerized machines, this might not be for you, but it's definitely my new favorite. Um, but no, I just wanna thank everyone so much for, for watching and for hopefully making this tulip block either turning it into a pillow, make it into a, a really fun throw, have a lot of fun. It's really easy to put together um, and bring, maybe bring someone in who's never done any quilting before and show them how fun it can be to make um, basic units and turn those basic units into a really cute block. All right, well, thank you so much for guiding us through today's project, Ashley. Before I let all of you out there viewing go, I do have a couple reminders for you. So first of all, we hope that you are doing these projects, if not right as we go through them live, on your own time after you get the chance to see the tutorials from our instructors. And we, of course, want to see those projects as you complete them. So if you are making any of the projects from this week, this mini series, make sure that when you share those on social media, you use the hashtag share craftsy. It's a great way to collect all of the work that the entire community is doing and so that we can see it and maybe get a chance to spotlight some of your work. So before I let you go today, I just want to remind you, please join us again tomorrow for the Spring Into Crafting mini series. It continues with our knitting instructor, Jen Lucas, and tomorrow's live event starts at 2 p.m. Central Time. Jen is going to be providing her tutorial on how to make a knitted spring tulip. So we're gonna keep the tulips going tomorrow and you can download the materials list and the free pattern right now using the link in the description so that you're ready before tomorrow's event starts. I will be here with you as well again so you can ask any questions as we go through and you can find the entire mini series schedule in the video description. On behalf of the entire team, thank you to Ashley for today and we will see you tomorrow for another project. Take care.